right. Good morning. Welcome to the session on rediscovering JavaScript. My name is Venkat Subramaniam. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff related to what I would like to call as modern JavaScript. We're going to talk about uh, features from ES6 predominantly and a few other things. Uh, this topic is uh, based on uh, the content I wrote recently in a book, which is with the same title called Rediscovering JavaScript. So we're going to talk about a lot of different things that JavaScript has evolved into, into a, a respectable language, in my opinion, for a lot of things we can do. If you really think about it, I wanted to you know, start by describing what JavaScript is. And, and it's kind of interesting to think about. We are, you know, the year is 2018, and we are here excited about JavaScript. So I was thinking, how do I describe what JavaScript is? And my description is, JavaScript is like that villain in a bad movie. They keep killing him, but he keeps coming back to life. That's the way I feel about it, isn't it? But, but it's a language that's evolved quite a bit, powerful every time around. And, and there's a lot of different exciting features in the language that I'm going to talk about today, things that I've really enjoyed. So I came across JavaScript uh, several uh, years ago, maybe a few decades ago, actually. And, and, and like everybody else, I would have to admit, I was pretty scared about JavaScript. But a lot of things have changed, both in me and in the language. I've kind of become a little bit more mature along the way. Not too much, though. But the language has become a lot better over the years, relatively speaking. And so it's a lot more approachable to me than it was once upon a time. So that's what I want to focus on here today, talking about what we can do with the language. Well, we're going to talk about this modern JavaScript. We're going to look at several beautiful features the language contains. And the very, very first thing to really think about is uh, out with the var. Well, what does that really mean? Let's talk about that with a little example here for a minute. We all have used JavaScript in the past, and we used var to define variables. So for example, I could say var, let's call it, go ahead and say a number equal to 2. And then I want to display the value of the number right after that. Well, this is a definition of a variable. You typically use a var to define variables. But unfortunately, there are some real big problems with var, and we should really not use it moving forward. For example, let's say I have a function called foo. And in programming, we always have to start with a function called foo, so I took care of that right here. And in this case, I'm going to define a local variable. I'll go ahead and say var local is uh, 1 is equal to 2, and I want to print the local variable. Now, clearly, when I go ahead and call the function foo here, if you will, you will notice that I'm able to print the local variable 1. That's not really a problem. On the other hand, if I try to print the local variable right here, I'll get an error, as you would expect. And that's exactly what you want to see, because local variable is local. But unfortunately, though, there are a few problems with var in the past. And, and that is, if you were to define a block scope, and within this, I'm going to say local 2 is equal to 3, and I want to print local 2 right in here, that worked really well. But unfortunately, though, JavaScript did not have a block scope for var in the past. So when JavaScript sees this little curly, it looks at the curly and says, what a nice curly, and throws it out. And it doesn't do anything with it. And as a result, if you notice over here, when I access local 2, I'm able to access it, which is really a bad news. Well, the reason for that is JavaScript is hoisting this variable all the way to the top. So this variable is defined up here, and then, of course, is given a value down here. And unfortunately, that's not what we really want. Another problem with this approach is if you were to define a var again, but by mistake you define local 1 one more time, notice that you don't get any errors. And JavaScript doesn't care to tell you, hey, are you serious now? You already defined this variable. Do you mean to really redefine it? So what do you do to fix this problem? Well, one of the problems is JavaScript doesn't have the luxury of a lot of other languages. What I mean by that is JavaScript cannot so easily deprecate things. Now, why can JavaScript deprecate things? The reason you cannot deprecate things in JavaScript is you are going to have a very old code, legacy code, written by people over time. 
And, and if you were to throw in a new JavaScript engine into a browser, and the new JavaScript engine changes the meaning of var, you're going to have a lot of trouble with legacy code that's already there. So as a result, you don't have the ability to just deprecate things in JavaScript. So what they did was they kind of left the old stuff the way it was and poured over the new stuff on top of it. The good news is you can use the new stuff. The bad news is the old stuff is still there, and you have to be sure not to use the old stuff. So this is where tools like ESLint can be very helpful. Tools like ESLint can help you to verify that you're using old stuff you're not supposed to use, and they can give you error or warnings, and you can deal with it pretty nicely. But moving forward, my recommendation is quit using var. That's really not a good idea. So what should we really do instead? Well, as much as possible, we want to use const. And if uh, we cannot use a const, then and only then we should really use a let. So let's take a look at how we're going to change this code to use those two ideas. So what I'm going to do here is, first of all, I'm going to change this to a const over here. And you can see the code still works. And we are using a const to define because I don't intend to really modify foo once I create this variable. Then, of course, I'm going to go back over here and define this as a let for now. And notice immediately I get an error. And the error is on line number uh, 12 because let will not allow me to redefine variables once it's been defined. So as a result, you can see line number 12 doesn't work because I've defined the variable local one using let. So let protects us from redefining variables that's been defined already. You can reassign values if you really wanted to because let is mutable, but you're not allowed to redefine a variable once you define them. Secondly, of course, one nice thing about let is or a const is, you can see that in this particular case, if I use a let or a const, doesn't matter. I cannot access local to outside of the block. So I get an error on line number 10. As you can see, line number 10 is not happy with me because the scope of the variable defined using a let or a constant is a block scope, and you cannot access it outside the block. So I cannot access that local to over here. So of course, the question then is, we shouldn't be using var, but should we use a let or should we use a const? And my general recommendation is use const where possible, and, 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 and of course, and only where not possible, uh, use let. So in other words, let should be the, uh, the var should be avoided, let should be the least preferred, const should be the most preferred. Now, why is a const a better idea? Well, the reason why const is a better idea is, so let's talk a little bit about constant and how we can benefit from that. So if I say let, let's say n is equal to 4, and I want to print the value of n, which is a value of 4, if I say n equal to 7, I can modify the value of n, as you can see. On the other hand, if I were to define a constant, you will notice I get an error on line number 5 because a constant will not allow us to modify it. Now, why am I so excited about this? And the reason for this is actually pretty simple. Let's say over here, factor equal to 2 for a minute. Now I'm going to write a function called printed. And the printed function says, give me an element e. And what I'm going to do is print out the element times factor. Now I want to call print it, and I'm going to call print it with, let's say, the value of 4, if you will. So when I run this code, you can see that in this particular case, a print it, of course. So in this case, when I run the code, you will notice it printed a value of 8. So there's no confusion so far. But I'm going to change it to a factor equal to 0. And I'm going to ask the question, what's the output? Now, let's think about this for a minute. When I didn't have that code, the output was 8. Now, of course, I set the value to 0. So let's kind of scratch our head a little bit. How many of us think the output is going to be an 8? Just a show of hand. Don't worry about being wrong. I'm wrong most of the time. So one person raises the hand saying that it's going to be 8. Uh, how many of us think it is 0? OK, a few more people raise the hand, a lot, of, lot more people. How many of you have no clue? They, uh, that's the camp I belong to, right? I look at this code, I'm like, I don't have a clue yet. And usually, before I have coffee, I don't have a clue. After I have coffee, I have no more clue anymore still, right? Coffee didn't help me in this case. Well, let's go ahead and run the code and see what happened. It gave us a value of 0, as you can see. 
But it doesn't matter what the output is. Do we really want to write code like this? That's the question. I usually use this code as an interview question, honestly. I will put this question for the interview and ask the candidate, what's the output? If they try to answer the question, I tell them they are fired already. Because the right answer they want, I want them to give is, are you all stupid? Because you don't want to write code like this because we want to release production code. This is horrible. So what do we want to do to avoid problems like this? Well, the uh, way to avoid problem like this is to simply say constant. If I define it as a constant, then clearly line number five is not working, and I will not be able to write code like this, and it's absolutely clear what the result is, and you want to write code that's easy to understand, easy to maintain, and, 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 and has few were errors, and so as a result, you really want to be able to write maintainable code. But of course, be a little bit careful about what constant really means in general, because you want to know constant is like final in Java, meaning it's going to protect the reference. It's not going to protect the object that is being referred to. So to understand this, let's take a look at a little bit of a, a further example in here. So we defined a constant, let's say n equal to 4. And clearly, n equal to 5 will not work. You're not allowed to modify a constant. So that was not a problem. On the other hand, I'm going to say constant sam is equal to, I'm going to say name is equal to sam. And of course, I'm going to provide an age is going to be, let's say, the value of 2. Now, of course, because I defined as a constant, if I were to go ahead and say uh, uh, Sam is equal to Sam, I'll get an error on line number five because I'm not allowed to mutate the variable Sam. So that was not a problem. On the other hand, if I say Sam.age is equal to three, notice I did not get an error. Now you're thinking, my goodness, what just happened over here? Well, if you actually display the value of Sam right now, notice the value did modify because a constant only protects the reference. The constant doesn't protect the object itself. Now the question is, of course, how do you really protect the object? There are two answers to that question. The first is, that's none of constant's business. Const is, I'm not really going to tell you, you know, about it. I'm not going to protect the object. So it's done. It only protects the reference. But if you really want to protect the object, what you can do, though, is you can go up here and you can take this object and you can use object.freeze and then you can actually freeze the object upon creation like that. So this is nothing to do with constant. This gives you an ability to uh, freeze an object. Now, when you do this, of course, the object Sam is frozen. And of course, the reference is constant as well. So you know that you cannot do Sam equal to Sam. That will not work. Line number five is failing. But of course, you know line number five is failing because of the const over here. On the other hand, if I say constant age equal to three, well, wait a minute, it did not give us an error at this point. So what's the point of asking it to freeze, you may wonder. Let's go back to this code and display this right now. And when you run it, notice it didn't change it. So what's really going on? Well, JavaScript treats you like a guest in its house. It doesn't yell at you and say, are you stupid? Why are you changing? It kind of smiles and quietly ignores you. So that's basically what happened here. But I'm a big fan of being yelled at, honestly, because I would like programs to fail loudly in front of me than quietly misbehaving. So how do we tell JavaScript, don't be such a great friend, yell at me if I'm doing something stupid? Well, you can do that by using useStrict, and useStrict will turn that into a yell. As you can see, line number six is failing right now, saying cannot assign property that is read only, and so as a result, it doesn't want you to modify it. My recommendation is always use use strict in code because it comes to your defense and fails fast and makes the code a lot more safer in that regard. So you don't want the code to quietly misbehave and ignore your call. You want that to fail at runtime to immediately trigger this. This can be very useful. Now, clearly one other thing to keep in mind, as much as I showed you a constant object.freeze, 
object.freeze is a shallow freeze. It's not a deep freeze. So if you have an object that's nested one more level, it's not going to deep, go deeper and freeze it. Of course, there are libraries in JavaScript. Of course, there's no surprise there are libraries in JavaScript. But there are libraries in JavaScript to perform the deep freeze for you. And you can use one of those libraries if you want to go further and deep freeze this object. Well, let's move a little forward. We talked about using let as much as possible. Use constant. When you cannot use constant, use let and quit using var. Let's move a little forward. Let's talk about uh, arguments. Well, arguments was a way in JavaScript that provided var args, which is really an interesting feature. I just absolutely loved this when I saw this uh, you know, uh, a long time ago. So let's look at an example of this. Let's say we have a max function I want to write. And the max function takes a and b as an argument. And I say, if a is greater than b, return the value of a. Otherwise, simply return the value of b. I want to call max with a 1 and 7. And you can see the result is a 7. I want to call max again with a value of, let's say, 3 and or 2. And the result is a 3. But what if I call max with a 1 and an 8 and a 3? Well, gosh, how did that work? I passed three arguments when only two were expected. Well, the reason for this is, first of all, the word works is a very loaded word in programming, right? So it doesn't actually work. So if I said 31, it gives us a wrong result, obviously. So it didn't quite actually work, but it did something. So these days, I don't say the code works. I simply say code behaves, right? That's all it did. But in this case, of course, what's going on? Well, it turns out that every function in JavaScript is a var arg function. In the case of languages like Java and C sharp, when you define a function to take a certain number of parameters, you can only pass that many arguments to that function. Not so in JavaScript. In JavaScript, every function can take variable number of arguments without you saying anything. So it turns out in this case, those arguments can be obtained by using a special keyword, which is called arguments, if you will. So when I run this code, you can see the arguments is loaded with all the values in that particular parameter list or argument list. But of course, this has been around for a very long time. But what I'm trying to say here is quit using arguments. Now, why should we not use arguments? There are some really big problems with arguments. Let's talk about what those are. The very first thing I want to talk about here is to output type of uh, arguments. I want to say arguments. Uh, so arguments is an instance of array. And notice it says false for every single one of them. Because arguments is not an array. Arguments is a very sad story. It wanted to be an array, but it never matured to be an array. So it's an array wannabe. But more important, if I want to really make use of this one, uh, uh, this example here, I'm going to say large is equal to zero. I want to return large in the very end. But within here, I'm going to say far. And what am I going to say here? I'm going to say, in this case, uh, a, a constant, Let's actually a let i equal to zero. And then I'm going to say i less than arguments dot length and i plus plus. And then, of course, I'm going to say if large is, uh, well, if the arguments at position i is greater than large, then I want to say large is equal to arguments at position i, and we could write the code like this. But of course, this is the imperative style of programming, and the code is not very elegant. Unfortunately, though, because arguments is not an array, you cannot call methods of array on an argument. What I would really like to do here is the following. I want to say arguments.reduce. But notice how reduce is undefined. It doesn't have a clue what reduce is. That's why it says undefined. So as a result, if I were to call reduce over here, that's not going to go really well because it blows up. So in other words, if I want to use methods of array on an argument, I have to first convert an argument into an array. So typically what programmers do is they write two more lines of code in here to convert arguments to an array. And that's a bloated code you have to copy and paste everywhere. That becomes verbose. It becomes error prone. And the code begins to really smell. So but why are we doing all of this? The reason we are doing all of this is, while the arguments was a really great idea, it was very poorly done. So what's the answer to solve that particular problem? The first answer is, 
quit using arguments. There should be no arguments about it. And then, of course, we'll start using REST instead. And REST is a much better replacement moving forward. I'm going to refactor this code right here to start using let, if you will. Notice when I run the code, it gives us the result, which is the correct result, as you can see. It gives us a 7, 3, and 31. And, and that's the right response for this particular code. But I want to refactor this to a better code. So how do we do that? The first thing I'm going to do here is to use values and our numbers, whatever you want to call it. But I want to put uh, make this a var arg or a rest arguments, like the rest of it. And you put three dots for that. So oh, one other pr uh, reason why I'm a big fan of this. If I look at this code as it is right now, if I ask you the question, how many arguments does Max take? The answer is, I don't have a clue. Because this is like the opposite day, right? If it doesn't take anything, you can send anything you want to it, which doesn't make any sense. So the only way to document this code is by writing a documentation or a comment. But I'm a big fan of self-documenting code. So when you look at the code, it's very obvious. Now, if you look at this right now, if I say number it's pretty darn clear what we are saying here. We are saying that the function max can take any number of arguments, 0, 1, 2, or more. So as a result, it becomes a lot easier to convey that intent very clearly. Now, of course, the code is still running. But right below this, I'm going to ask the question, is numbers uh, over here an array? And if I run this code notice, while the first one is a false, the second is a true, because a rest parameter is actually an array type, unlike arguments, which are really not an array type. So this is already a lot better, as you can see here. Now that we know that numbers is an array, notice what I'm going to do here. I'm going to just do an in-place replacement. Wherever arguments is being used, I'm going to change it to numbers. And you can see the code is still working. That is another nice thing about REST parameter is that anywhere you're using arguments already, you can very easily search and replace that with a REST parameter. But as a bonus, though, because we are able to do this, notice what I'm going to do now. We can take all that fluff out of here from the imperative style code, and we can write a functional style code really nicely. We can say numbers.reduce right here. And then we can say large comma element. And I can then say if large, if element is greater than large, then return the element for me. Otherwise, return a large. And as a result, you can write the code a lot more elegantly, as you can see. So without having to write that many lines of code, you can use a functional style code to write it. Of course, you have to debug this a little bit more and make sure it works for various uh, arguments you provide. But it kind of takes you in the right direction to show you what you can do with it. So this becomes a light, nice, elegant way. And as a result, rather than writing so much fluffy code, code, you are able to write a lot less code, and that becomes a lot better as well. So moving forward, start using REST arguments rather than using arguments, REST parameters rather than using arguments. That's a lot better way to do this. So we saw what a REST is, but let's talk about what a spread is. A spread is the other side of this. Now, it turns out two things, two operators in JavaScript use the same symbol. The three dots is used for rest on the receiving side, but the three dots are also used on the sending side for a spread operator. To understand this, let's take a slightly different example. Suppose we have a constant, let's say values equal to, and I say 1, 2, and 1, 12, and uh, 7. But I want to go ahead and call max with this and get the result. So if I set values over here, notice that did not quite work. And the reason is, because the numbers is an array, it is expecting, however, because it's a rest parameter, it's expecting discrete values to be passed in. In this case, we passed one array. So that entire array was sent as the first element of this other array. And so as a result, that did not quite go well. But what can I do instead of this? Well, here's an idea. I can take this code right now, and I can say 0, 1, 2. I can pass it like this. 
But if I write code like this, the good comment is, I need another job, isn't it? Because that's not a very pleasant code to write. That's very boring. So what can we do to minimize that effort? Well, you can call max, but you can use a triple dot right there. And you can say values right there. And that becomes a spread operator. So the same three dots you can see on the receiving side is the rest parameter. On the sending side, it becomes the spread operator because you're taking the collection of data and you are spreading it. Make no mistake, the spread is not tied to the rest in any way. They are completely independent of each other. So for example, not only can you use the spread when you have a rest on the other side, but you can also use it when you don't have spread or rest on the other side. So to understand this, let's take an example of a greet function. And I'm going to say in the greet function, I'm going to take a name 1, comma name 2, if you will. And I'm going to go ahead and print out right here. We'll go ahead and say hello, dollar name 1. And then we will say dollar name 2. I'm using the string literal right here. I can call greet and I can send Jack comma Jill. And you can see that in this case, I've sent two arguments to the two parameters that I have name 1 and name 2. But on the other hand, if I said names is equal to, and I have Tom comma Jerry, let's say, over here, but I want to be able to pass this to the greet function. Now, clearly, you know this is not going to work because it says Tom, Jerry, and undefined, and that's not really what we wanted. So what can we do about it? We also know this is not going to really make new friends. If we write code like this, that's really boring. What you can do instead is you can call greet and you can spread it. And notice even though there is no rest on this side, you are able to use a spread on this side. And that's one of the powerful ways of using spread. You can pretty much ask it to take a collection of data and spread it across. And that works really well, as you can see. So that gives you an idea about how you are able to use a spread on this side. But what is really cool about spread is it's absolutely versatile. So I'm going to give you a few more examples of how we can use spread. So I'm going to say names 1 equal to, and const names 2 equals to, let's go ahead and say uh, tyke over here. So I want to now take this over, and I want to write a code like this. I can say a dot, dot, dot names 1. This literally gives you back the same thing, but you're exploding or spreading the content of that array into this other array. But I can then say comma, and I can then say spike over here, and I just created a new collection with the old collection Tom and Jerry, but with the value spike in it. But I can then say comma, and I can say names two over here, and now we are able to add a type to it as well. So this gives a really nice power to manipulate these arrays with exploding these arrays or spreading these arrays internally, and that gives you an enormous power on your hand. But not only can you use a spread like this, but it can be even more powerful. If you're used to something like uh, Redux, you probably have seen the syntax I'm going to show you next. And it's a really powerful way to make copies of objects. So to understand this, let's take a look at a slightly different example. We looked at how we can combine arrays, but you can also go a little further with this. Let's say for a minute we have a constant, Sam is equal to name that's going to be Sam. And I'm going to say over here, age is going to be, let's say, 2. Let's go ahead and make this a freeze, object.freeze. So I cannot modify Sam, which is what I normally like to do when I program in tools like libraries like Redux. I don't want to be mutating my object. But I want to make a copy of Sam. Maybe I want an older Sam. How do I do that? So constant Sam, we'll call it as older Sam, is equal to, hmm, how do I do this? So name, Sam.name right here. And then I can say age is going to be Sam.age plus 1. And of course, if I were to go ahead and output, let's say Sam, but I also want to output older Sam, you can see that the Sam's age is 2, but older Sam's age is 3. But I did something absolutely terrible right now. Why The reason why this code is really a bad code is, let's say a few weeks goes by in a large application. It's not like it's right there in front of it. You could have created this object in some place of your code. You might be making a copy in completely a different place in your code. If you're doing that, what's going to happen? Maybe a few weeks goes by, and you decide to change this particular object. 
And now Sam here, even though Sam is two years old, you know how kids these days are, this Sam already has a Twitter ID. And so this Sam contains a Twitter ID. So I'll say example at example. I don't have a clue whose Twitter ID that is. This is purely a fictitious. I'm not talking about any specific person just for the sake of argument. We'll just say example Sam, uh, uh, Sam, Sam here. And now, of course, when I run the code, unfortunately, how sad our new Sam doesn't have a Twitter ID. Maybe Sam tweeted like my president, they withdrew the Twitter permission the parents did, but the point really is that uh, we don't want to make a copy like that. We want the Twitter ID to be available for Sam. What do I do right now? Well, if I were to come in here, one way to fix it is I can come here and say Twitter colon, and then I can say Sam.Twitter. Now, the only good part about this is job security, isn't it? Because you can keep maintaining this code over and over and over, but at some point we'll begin to hate this job eventually because that's not very extensible code. Gosh, that's really smelly. Because a few weeks later we add a Facebook ID for Sam and the whole code is broken again. What can we do about it? Let's withdraw from that code for a minute. Let's go back all the way without really bringing in the Twitter ID at the moment. So what am I going to do now? Let's go ahead and remove the Twitter ID for a second. Let's go ahead and run this code. You can see that working. But I'm going to come in here and say, all right, I want to modify the age, fine. But the rest of it, I want to just spread it. And I'm going to ask it to be spreading the same right there. Look at how powerful that really is. What is the benefit of this? Notice from this output, if I go back here and add a Twitter ID to Sam right now, I don't have to babysit this code because the older Sam contains the same Twitter ID without me having to really modify the code. So that is one of the biggest benefits you get out of this. The spread operator can be used to spread your object as well when you're making copies of this. Like I mentioned, you probably have seen this if you have used tools like libraries like Redux, because we want to treat objects as immutable. So when you make a copy of the object, obviously, you don't want to be really uh, you know, making copies of every single field. That's not a very extensible code. The spread really saves you a lot of effort to do that. A very powerful idea, as you can see here. So that is about spread. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of these ideas later on. We got a lot more other features, beautiful features. But I do have to admit that spread is probably the second feature in JavaScript that I really like. I've saved the uh, first uh, favorite feature of mine for a later time. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, further. Let's now move a little forward. Let's talk about default parameters. Now let's say for a minute we have a function called greet. And the function greet is taking a name as an argument. And here I'm going to print hello followed by the name itself. Now I'm going to go ahead and call greet, if you will. But I'm going to call greet and pass, let's say, uh, Jane over here. Now when I run this code, you can see it says hello, Jane. But maybe tomorrow I decide to customize this. I want to pass a message to the greet function because sometimes I want to say hello, sometimes I want to say hi. Whatever it is I want to keep changing, what can I do about it? Well, here's a nice feature to fix it. If I were to ch add a new parameter over here, like a message, that may end up breaking existing code, which is not fun. I don't want to break existing code. So I want to take this object uh, greet and pass Jane, but I want to say hi to it. But if I don't pass anything, I want it to be some value after all. As you can see here, you don't want it to say undefined Jane. Uh, Jane just unfriended you on Facebook, right? You don't want to be really that rude. You want to say nice greeting messages. So what can you do to evolve this code? Well, what you can do here is to go to this method, and you can, at the parameter, you can specify something to replace it. So you can see that it says howdy Jane right there, and you're able to pass a default argument to it. So that becomes a nice way to pass default parameters. So de default parameters are a nice way for us to really extend existing functions to really add a, a new parameter if you really wanted to. Let's look at one other feature in JavaScript. You will see this feature is pretty darn powerful. You will see this feature in other languages like Kotlin as well. So a lot of these languages are beginning to really use some of these nice features. So for example, if I were to go back to this code, and I'm going to say Jerry right here, 
And when I run this code, you can see that it says, you know, uh, Jerry. Well, I want to print out the greet for this, and you can see that it says, hi, Jerry. But one of the nice features in JavaScript is the default parameters can actually use values of parameters to its left. So the message parameter, there's a parameter to its left, which is the name. So what I can do here is I can say name.length, if you will, and, and as a result, this is a nice geeky way of saying hi fi to Jerry. So you can do that as well in simply saying, I want one default argument to use another default argument. And obviously, if you were to give a value to this one, if you say, for example, uh, over here, uh, Jerry, and I'm going to say hello, well, obviously, it says hello, Jerry, at that point. Whereas on the first one, because it didn't pass any argument, it can only take the default value, but the default value is not a default value, it's a default expression. So that expression is evaluated, and that expression can use any parameters to its left, or any parameter in its lexical scope, for that matter, can become very handy as well. So this gives you a little nice feature for you to use, as you can see. So that's about default parameters. Couple of things to keep in mind when it comes to default parameters. You are able to define a default parameter. You saw to send a value. You saw how a default value was used. However, be a little careful about it. Now, suppose you were to call this one and don't pass anything. It says, hi fi, Jerry. But if I were to call this and pass a null, I know null is a smell. We should not really do this. But it says, null, Jerry. That didn't go really well. However, if you were to call this and say Jerry comma undefined, notice that's a little weird, isn't it? Null is a null, but undefined actually is replaced by the default value. Now, for the two things I want to say, first of all, uh, first is don't do this, right? So it really is smelly. Don't do this. However, you may be curious, why did they treat undefined different than a null? And the reason is, if you are receiving an object from, let's say, uh, another function, that object may or may not have a property. Well, here's the beauty. When you receive an object from another function, if a property doesn't exist, that property is considered to be undefined. Well, if a property is undefined, you can substitute a default value for it very easily because of this feature. And that is why they treat undefined differently than uh, the other uh, null. And as a result, that's a little bonus that you can get out of this, which is really nice. Well, now let's move a little forward. Let's talk about enhanced for loops. And enhanced for loops are a very elegant way to iterate over a collection of data. I'm going to go through a few different refactoring of this code to understand a few little nice things we can do with this. So let's go ahead and start with a little example here, if you will, of a constant. Let's go ahead and say constant names is equal to, let's go ahead and say we have Tom and Jerry right here in this example. But I want to loop through these values. How do I do this? So I can say over here, let i equal to 0, i less than names.length. And then, of course, i plus plus. And then I can print out the value of i, and then maybe two dashes. And then I can print the value of name square bracket i. Well, that worked, but we know this is a very boring code. It's an imperative style code. It's noisy, and, and it's not very uh, elegant and fun to write code like this. Well, but you can actually write a much better code in JavaScript now. So you can say for, and in this case, I'm going to say constant. That's already a bonus, isn't it? Rather than using a let, I'm able to use a constant. So I'm saying a constant name of names over here. And then I'm going to output the name that's given to me. So this becomes a nice, elegant way to write a for loop. So for constant name of names, and then you're able to iterate over the names and print the value. Now, clearly, that's elegant. It's fewer moving parts. It's, it's easier to write as well. And as a bonus, the name is a constant. If you try to modify the name, you will get an error, which makes the code a lot more safer. But of course, there is one disadvantage in the code we just wrote. The top one, as verbose and ugly it was, it did have one advantage. It gave us the index value. If I don't have a need for the index value, then this is a better option to use. But if I do need the index value, what gives? What should I really do? 
Well, for that purpose, what you could do is you could write a for loop again constant and you could say entry of names.entries and you could write a piece of code which uses entries. And then I can print out the entry right there. Now, when you look at this code, you can see that I'm able to get the entry values and the entry values gives me the index and the value at that index as an array. Well, yeah, that's great, we are able to use it, but wait a minute, I really wanted the index value and the entry uh, value at the index separately, but how do I really get those values? All right, fair enough, let's try this one more time. I could write code like this and say over here, output the value for the entry at square bracket zero, and then a two dashes, and then an entry, and then a square bracket one. Well, that worked to produce the same result as line number four, but I know this is not making you happy, right? You look at this code and say, that smelly code, Venkat, come on, we want something better than that. It shouldn't be really that ugly. Well, I agree with you. So this is a good step, but it's got to be a lot more cleaner than this. Let's try to do this one more time. Let's get back here and say a constant i is equal to entry square bracket zero. And then I'm going to say constant name is equal to entry square bracket one. Then this line number four can readily be used over here. And of course, I can use the i and I can use the name, not names of course, so it's a little bit better than even that line. I can write code like this. But of course, you look at this code and say, all right, you took one line of ugly code and made it three lines of ugly code now. I know that's not making you happy either. All right, fine, so very uh, uh, hard crowd to please, but let me try again. Let's go a step further, and I'm gonna show you a feature which is my most favorite feature in JavaScript, which is destructuring. Now, destructuring is a weird name, so destructuring. Now, take the word structuring for a minute. What does structuring really mean? Structuring is construction. So construction and deconstruction or destructuring is the opposite of construction. So construction is where you take different pieces of data and put, the, put a structure or a class together. Destructuring is the opposite. You take what is structured and you tear it apart to create different pieces of data. So it's the opposite of structuring. That's what you're trying to really do here. So what I'm gonna do in this case is in one shot, I'm going to destructure this. So I'm gonna put a little curly right there, actually an array right there because it's an array. And I'm gonna say name and put entry right there. And I can do the destructuring in one shot as you can see right there. Well, that was a little bit better. I'm not saying it's excellent, but it's a little bit better than the previous one because we are using destructuring of an array at this point. Well, yeah, that's great, but why can't we just go a little bit further? So I'm gonna take this one this time around and I'm going to simply say, take that part right in there and replace the entry with it and get rid of this now, and now you can see how you're able to use that pretty elegantly. So you can see how we kind of arrived at that. This is destructuring happening while you are actually iterating over the entries. So it's a very common piece of code to see in modern JavaScript, but knowing why it works actually makes it easier because the first time I came across that code on line 30, I was pretty confused. I'm like, my goodness, what's going on here? So I had to really walk my way through each of these steps and that made a lot more sense for me and I hope it does for you too. So in a sense, what we are doing is line number 26 is doing destructuring. Line number 25 is just iterating. We combine the two together, we are iterating and destructuring at the same time on line number 30, that's what we are doing. So that's really destructuring the entries that it's pulling out, and as a result, we are able to write the code like that. So, as, so now we can go back to the code we had originally to the code we have here, and both of them produce the same result as you can see, but we are able to take a traditional loop or we can use an enhanced for loop like you see right in here. So that gives you an idea about how elegantly you're able to write this looping. Well, having said that though, but what about our own user-defined types? Wouldn't it be nice to do this for our own code as well? Well, that would be really awesome. 
Now, before I jump into this example, I've got a little warning. Um, I'm going to turn on the seat belt and do play a, a wear your seat belt. If the oxygen mask comes from the ceiling, please put it on yourself first before you help the person next to you. It's going to be a little bumpy right for the next 10 minutes or so. I'm going to show you a really nasty way to write an Ada writer. And when you're done with it, I'm going to show you a much better way to write it. And you'll be so happy to see the better way because you don't have to write the nasty way. Then why do I want to show you the nasty way? Well, because it's a lot of fun to see it. And it's also knowing how it works under the hood. It gives me the pleasure of doing two things. I know how it works, and I have the wisdom not to ever try it at home. So let's get ready. So here you go. I turn on the seat belt now. So let's talk about how this is going to work. Work. So let's go ahead and create our own class for a minute. So the class I'm going to create is called a car class, but I'm also going to create a class called wheel, and I'm going to obviously use wheels in my car. We'll come to that in just a few minutes. So what does the car class contain? The constructor says uh, uh, over here, uh, this dot wheels is equal to, and I'm going to define an array of wheels. So the first entry here is new wheel, but I'm going to provide three more of these objects for four wheels of the car. Let's stop for just one minute and celebrate something which is just absolutely amazing. Notice when I ran the code, it ran with no errors, but did you notice I ended the array with a comma? Now, only programmers will understand what this means, isn't it? Because the first day I saw that, I literally screamed. And the people around me said, why are you so excited about a stupid comma in the end? I'm like, you don't understand this stuff. This is amazing. So the next time I want to write something, I can just add stuff and leave a comma. And then I can add a stuff and leave a That's amazing, isn't it? So you can end any structure in JavaScript with a comma if it's a collection. This is uh, reducing a lot of noise in the code in general. When I do this in Java, usually, I, I, I'm sure you've all seen people do this, right? They put a comma here instead of here. Why? Because they want to continue writing the next line when they come in. We kind of write ugly code to work around the language limitations. JavaScript says, why not just end with a comma? You can just continue with it. So that's right there. You can just end it with a comma. Now what I want to do is I want to iterate over this. So I'm going to say for, I will say constant wheel, and, and in this case, of car, and I want to go ahead and print out the wheel, where car, of course, is an object. So I'm going to say constant car equal to new car, and I want to run this. And that didn't go really well. If you notice, it says car is not iterable. Well, we'll come back and talk about this in a few minutes. We got some work to do. But before we do this, let's step back and talk about JavaScript uh, in general. JavaScript does not have a concept of interfaces. So in languages like Java, we have interfaces. So remember the code error I got? It said that code is not iterable. So what would you do in Java or C Sharp at this point? You will immediately implement an interface called an iterable, right? That's what you're going to do. You're going to implement an iterable interface. Well, but JavaScript doesn't have a concept of interfaces. Again, what gives? How do you really do this if there is no concept of interfaces? Well, the problem with not having an interface really is not that interfaces are absolutely essential, but one thing that interfaces do give you, well, there are two things interfaces give you, right? One thing an interface gives you is a collection of methods. And if you know that if you have implemented an interface, you got all, all the bunch of methods. But the other thing that interfaces give you really well is uh, avoiding a method name collision. If I have an interface implemented, I know for sure that's the method I'm implementing. But because JavaScript doesn't have interfaces, if, you, if I want you to implement a method called foo, we got a few problems. You implement a method called foo, which is wrong because the case is different. That's one problem. Even worse, you come across my library, and I tell you to implement a method called foo, and you protest saying, I already have a method called foo in my class for an entirely different purpose. What do I do now? And the short answer is, good luck. You cannot use my library with your code unless you put a wrapper around it, and it really turns into a mess. 
In other words, you want something unique. And interfaces give you that uniqueness of methods, and JavaScript doesn't have that concept. Well, how do you fix it? One way to fix it is to have interfaces, but JavaScript said, no, we can't have interfaces because JavaScript is dynamically typed. It becomes a lot messy to really deal with interfaces. So they did a, something a little different. In JavaScript, you have five primitive types so far, isn't it? So what are the five primitive types you have? You have a Boolean, you have a number, a string, a null, and you have undefined. Well, now you have a sixth primitive type in JavaScript, and that primitive type is called a symbol. And a symbol is special because a symbol is unique. And because a symbol is unique, if you create a symbol as a method as a symbol, then you can enf enforce that somebody implementing your method, there's a guarantee of what they implement if they implement a method with your own symbol because symbols give you uniqueness. Let's do, look at one example of this. So I'm gonna say s1 equal to a symbol dot for, I'm gonna say hi. And I'm gonna print s1. Notice it's a hi, no, no surprise there. But I'm gonna create one more symbol right here and the symbol s2 and this is gonna become, uh, let's say, a hello. And of course, I wanna print what is in S2, and that's a hello. But if I print S3, notice that it's a high. But what's really interesting about this though, is if I ask if S1 is equal to S2, notice that's a false, they're not equal. But if I ask is S1 equal to S3, notice it is a true, because the symbols are unique when you create them, and because the symbol value is the same for both one and three, that true actually end up, comparison ended up being a true in the very end, as you can see right in here. So that gives you an idea of what a symbol can do. Where am I going with this? Where I'm going with this is I could say class, Let's say, uh, let's go ahead and create a little uh, object uh, in this case, and I'm gonna say uh, a class person, and, and within this person, I'm gonna say a constant Sam equal to new person, but I'm gonna say Sam.play uh, to call a play method. Now, of course, I can write a play method right here, and I can say uh, playing, if you will, but when I run this code, it says playing. But the problem with this, what I just did is, the method play is an arbitrary name I created. But what if you are having an interface called, uh, you know, a, a player, and that interface has a method called play? Now we are in trouble, isn't it? Because your interface wants me to implement a play method, but I already have a play method. What gives? How do we prevent this collision? Oh, here's an idea. Your interface, I'm saying interface here loosely, your interface contains a method not called as play, but a symbol dot for play. Huh, what does that mean then? So I can go back over here and say a symbol, over here a symbol uh, dot for play, and, and so as a result, notice the name of the method is a, a, a symbol itself. Then how do I call this method? I can simply come in here and I can put a square bracket. Well, actually, let's go ahead and say a play method is equal to symbol dot for, and I'm gonna say play right there. And then I can come in here and I can call the play method as a, as a method name in here, if you will. And so that becomes a very easy way for me to invoke the method. So a symbol can become a method name. And, and the reason to do this is it gives us uniqueness of a method name and it avoids method name collision. Now let's get back to the example we were working with and see how this is going to benefit. So when I run this code, notice it says that a constant wheel of car, car is not iterable. Uh, make sure to tighten your seat belt. We're gonna look at how to make this work. So it says the car is not iterable. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna implement an iterator for this purpose. How do I write an iterator? So I'm gonna say square bracket symbol dot iterator and that becomes a special name of a method. So JavaScript has a bunch of these symbols predefined. There's a symbol dot iterator, symbol dot match, and so on. 
So these are well-known method names, well-known symbols that JavaScript relies upon. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and implement the method symbol.iterator. And all I'm going to do here simply is say called. So we're going to take baby steps, one step at a time, and make this code to work. Now when I run this code, good news, the error is different as you can see. What was the error a minute ago? A minute ago the error was car is not iterable. Now the error is different as you can see. Now the error says result of symbol iterator method is not an object. There is hope here, isn't it? Now JavaScript says you're a good friend now. You have implemented an iterator, but one more problem, you need to return an object for me. Oh, no worries, return an object. How does, how does that go, JavaScript? Now the error is different. It says undefined is not a function. That's a very helpful error message, isn't it? So, so what are we gonna do? Well, undefined is not a function. Well, okay, it's expecting a function to be present in this object. What kind of function does it want in this object? So I'm gonna go to this object and I'm gonna provide a, a function that it wants to return. So undefined is not a function, that's what it said. So I'm going to return a next over here, which is going to be a function I'm going to implement within this object. So I'm going to say function, and, and let's start with that. Now let's see what it says. Iterator result undefined is not an object. Hey, that's great. We moved on from one error to the next one. It wants to see an object. So what am I going to do? Return, and I'm going to return an object right there. So let's go ahead and run this code now. And what does it say? Well, I shouldn't have done that, actually. Sorry. So that kind of went into a beach ball, as you can see. Now this kind of gives you a clue what's happening. So while I restart this, what I'm going to show you, though, is that it is going to, uh, here's what JavaScript is actually doing. Uh, uh, before we go further and, and fix it, Let's go over here and uh, try to find and kill this first of all. So I'm going to go ahead and do a, a grep on node over here, which is what I'm running. And let's go ahead and kill this. I'm usually a very polite person, but sometimes you do have to do this kind of killing of the process. So let's see if that actually works. Uh, so a uh, no such process. Let's see. Uh, nope, that's still running. So let's go ahead and find out what I'm doing right uh, wrong here. Uh, that actually disappeared. Let's see why. OK, there you go. All right, now it took a little while to uh, die. But let's see what I'm doing wrong here. Well, what happened here is the following scenario. I know this is a little weird, but this is how the iterator actually works. When you take an object and use an enhanced for loop, JavaScript first looks for an iterator. If the iterator is not present, it gives you an error. Hey, the iterator is present. Hey, are you returning an object, if not an error? Oh, yes, I'm returning an object. Awesome. Does your object have a method called next? Uh, no, it's an error. Oh, yes, I do have a method called next. Good. Are you returning an object to me? Yes. Well, does that object have a done as a field and true as a result and a value? Let's just throw in a value of one for now arbitrarily. Now notice my done is true. I go to the command prompt right now, and I'm going to say node sample.js, and I quit immediately. And the reason is we said done is true. On the other hand, if I said false over here, what's going to happen? It calls the next function. It gets an object. The done is false. It calls the next again. The done is false. It calls the next again. And that's going to keep going for, like, ever. So when I run this code, that's never going to terminate. Just to illustrate the point, if I go back to this example one more time, and in here I'm going to say, let count is equal to zero, and I'm going to return a value of count plus plus, just to entertain this thought. Now if I go back and run this code, you can see that count increasing constantly. So hopefully that gives you an idea how this works. But of course, I want to iterate over the wheels of the car. So what am I going to do? Oh, this is not that hard then. Let self is equal to this. And now I can come in here and say, actually, let's do it this way. Let index is equal to minus 1. And I can come in here and say, this is going to become the self square bracket. Well, uh, self dot uh, wheels uh, square bracket index 
plus plus and let's go ahead and say constant self is equal to this. I'm usually a good, uh, good at getting off by one errors, so let's see if that actually makes sense. So I start with the zero to begin with, and now I've incremented it one, two, and so on, and I'm gonna simply say index is equal to four, then I am done. Otherwise, keep returning a false. And let's see if that actually does anything good. Let's go ahead and fire this up, and there are your four wheels that it printed. So this is an example of using an iterator to implement an iterator on your own class. Uh, raise your hand if you want to write that code. Not a single volunteer, no. Okay, I kind of understand why, right? That's error prone, tedious, and very few people will survive that, right? So that's not fun. So, but you know exactly how it works. Now you want to say, all right, I understand how this works. Get me out of here, right? So let me turn off the seat belt now. Relax, it's going to be just fine now. We can, we're going to use what is called a generator for this purpose. So how does a generator look like? Let's get rid of all that uh, code. And all we can do is simply put a little star, how beautiful that is. So that becomes a generator. This gives a clue to the JavaScript engine to say, hey, why don't you implement a generator for me so I don't have to work this hard? So yield, and I'm gonna say this dot wheels square bracket zero, and I can ask it to provide me four different values at this point. So I could say, give me one, two, and three, and it gives you the four wheels. Isn't that so much better? Well, internally, it's doing a lot of stuff we did already, but we don't have to work that hard. But the nice thing about this is you can use the yield in a very better way than this. So for example, you can do this way. You could say for, and in this case, you can say constant wheel of this dot wheels, and why not simply say over here, yield a wheel. So you could write code like that as well, where through the iteration, you can start yielding a value out. Uh, alternatively, what you could also do is something even better. This is where the power of the language shines. You can say yield, and you can simply say, this is gonna be this dot wheels, and I want to return all the wheels and do the ex expansion right there, and generator results in another generator. So you can write all this code very elegantly. Uh, one of the things is to really understand how things work, and then you can, of course, leverage some of these things very nicely without having to do a lot of extra work, and that saves you a lot of effort as well. So that gives you an idea about how to use that special uh, iterators, and you can use a generator as well. So we talked about quite a number of things already. We talked about the uh, use of var versus let and constant. We talked about the rest and spread. We talked about the default parameters. And then, of course, we talked about enhanced for loops, and we talked about generators. The next thing I'm going to talk about is something that is nice, but we have to be very careful. And that is the use of arrow functions. So let's start with a little example of an arrow function, and then we'll talk about why this is something that we have to be very careful about. So the first thing I wanna show you here is a greet function, and this is a regular function, as you can see, it takes a name, and, and it simply prints out, let's say, a hello, and then it prints a name right there. So I call greet with, let's say, uh, a Sam here, and it says, hello, Sam. Well, we can write this as an arrow function rather than using it as a regular function. So what I could do here is I can grab this code right there, and rather than doing it this way, we could simply write it as such. We could remove this word function. We could remove the parenthesis if we don't care about it, put a little arrow, and you can remove this ending curly. So what is an arrow function? Well, an arrow function is nothing but a lambda, right? So a lambda, but it's actually an anonymous function as much as it is, but the, uh, p uh, the, the format of this is parameter uh, list, uh, and then a uh, arrow, and then of course the body, a single line body. If you want a multi-line body, I usually discourage that, but you can put a curly and put a multi-line body in there. But in this case, as you can see here, you have a parameter list, an arrow, and a body. That's a bit of a sad news. If you're writing Java code, you know the syntax is parameter list, a single arrow, and a body. 
Well, in JavaScript, it's not a single dash, it's a double dash. Those of you who program Java and JavaScript, you are forever cursed, right? Because this is going to be painful when you're typing your code, your mind doesn't flip so quickly. You'll put a single arrow in JavaScript, and then you code for a few hours, you go back to Java, you put a double arrow on that, and it gets really, really vexing. There is no real good way to, well, almost no good way to handle it. What you can do is you can create a macro on your machine, and then you can use one symbol, and it will expand based on the language you're using. That way, when you go to somebody's machine, else's machine, you'll have no clue how to program anymore, right? So the point really is, you just have to go through that mental shift when you use multiple languages. So that's a little arrow function you are defining. Now, clearly, when you look at this code, it's pretty darn tempting, isn't it? Hey, look, the arrow function is so concise. Why shouldn't I use an arrow function all the time rather than using a regular function? And the short answer to that question is you have to be very careful about the semantical differences between those two. So we looked at the structure of the arrow function, but there is a huge semantical difference between a regular function and an arrow function. Now, when they introduced arrow functions, arrow functions are not a stand-in replacement for regular functions. And if we don't remember this, we're gonna be in real trouble and we could be uh, inviting some bugs in the code. If you have a lot of really good automated testing, maybe those will catch you early on. If you don't, or if the situation where it escapes through, you have to be very careful about it. So let's understand what that means uh, with an example. Now, before we go further, let's talk about scoping. So what, uh, what, is, uh, what, what are the two kinds of scoping that we, will, that we need to be concerned about? So there are two kinds of scoping. The first is called lexical, uh, lexical scoping. So what is lexical scoping? Lexical scoping is where uh, 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 an unbounded, unbounded variable uh, is bounded to a definition uh, in the defining scope. Uh, in other words, you can eyeball, uh, eyeball the code and find the variable to bind it to. So this is basically what a lexical scope really is. So when you have an unbounded variable, that variable is bound to a variable in, in the defining scope. And, and in other words, you have a variable which is undefined, unbounded, and you're like, gosh, what is this variable? I don't see it. You quickly eyeball the code and say, oh, look, it's over there. I can bind to it. And that is a very easy way to do this. So as an example, you know, here I am, uh, but I'm thirsty. I want some water. Well, good news, I didn't have to bring the water with me. I can reach over and get the water that's on the desk over here. Well, the desk is a defining scope. I want a bottle of water. I don't have a bottle of water, but I can eyeball, hey, there's a wa bottle of water here, I can reach and grab it. So this is really what a lexical scoping is, that it's in the context of defining scope wherever it is. But on the other hand, you can also look for what is called a dynamic scope. So what is dynamic scope? Dynamic scoping is where an unbounded variable uh, is bound to a, val a variable uh, passed in, uh, passed in by the caller of the function. So in other words, when a variable is unbounded, you're like, gosh, I don't know where this variable is coming from. Uh, you cannot eyeball the code to find it. Whoever called you is going to pass that to you. And, and so if you have a, a lexical scoping, it doesn't matter who is calling you, it's the same value you're going to bind to. In the case of a dynamic scoping, on the other hand, if there are three callers, the value may be three different values to that variable depending on who is calling it. And so dynamic scoping gives you a lot more flexibility, but it can be really hard as well. Now let's think about this for a minute. There are three kinds of languages out there. What I like to call as kind languages. What are kind languages? Kind languages care about you, the programmer. They don't want to hurt you. And what do kind languages do? Uh, use lexical scoping. Why, why is that? Because lexical scoping is easier on us. You can eyeball the code and say, hey, that variable, I got this. The code is easier to reason. The code is easier to understand. 
So that's basically what a lexical scoping really is. So kind languages use lexical scoping. Um, on the other hand, uh, unkind languages use dynamic scoping. They want to mess with you. They are a little unkind to you. And you look at this code, hey, where's this variable coming from? Usually a shrug, I don't know. And you have to go back and look at it. But then there are third kind, evil languages use both. And why? Because they are so much more fun to work with. Um, so what language is, is kind of this? Almost all the languages that we use, isn't it? Java, C Sharp, Ruby, Python, Smalltalk, keep going. Every single one of them use dynamics, uh, lexical scoping. Very few languages do this. Uh, Perl may be one example. But can you think of a language which is that evil? Yeah, you know, right? You're looking at one. And, and JavaScript is one of those languages that does both. And this is why you see people do often var that equal to this. Or you saw me use self early on. There's a reason for that because that's let's dynamic scoping uh, kicking in. To understand this a little bit better, let's look at uh, these two scoping first of all. So first of all, I'm gonna create a foo equal to function. I take a variable here, and I'm going to simply print the variable that I am receiving at this point. This is just a local variable, a parameter. So I'm gonna call foo with a seven. No surprise it printed a value of seven over there. However, I'm going to define constant uh, stuff equal to four. And I'm going to go ahead, go ahead and print stuff over here. I want you to watch this carefully. We, if you look at this function, it's very clear what n is. n is a local parameter, local variable parameter in this case. And so it's very clear what n on line number four is. n on line number four is the parameter on line number three. Hey, but what is stuff on line number five? Gosh, I don't know what stuff is on line number five. It's unbounded. In the highlighted code, stuff is not defined. So I'm gonna eyeball the code. Oh, look, line number one has a stuff. That is lexical scoping, isn't it? So that is lexical scoping, and as a result, when I run the code, it's bound to four. So there's no surprise over there. However, what I wanna do next is to say, this dot something is equal to 12. And I come in here and say output this dot something. When I run the code though, notice it did not say 12. It said undefined. And the reason is that in a regular function, so let's go ahead and write this. In a regular function, uh, when you define using the word function, uh, uh, all variables are lexically scoped except, there's always a special, right? Except this and arguments. So this and arguments are dynamically scoped, which are dynamically scoped. So all variables are lexically scoped, except this and arguments are dynamically scoped. Obvious, the question is, how do I get this dynamic scoping to get the this? Uh, very simple. When I run the code, notice it said undefined. On the other hand, I can call foo with a call, and here I can say something colon 42, comma seven, and when I run this code, you can see the value is 42. And the reason the value is 42 is because that this is dynamically scoped. To the point I made earlier, if the caller were to be different, notice in this case, I'm gonna say 77, the value is different every time you call this, and, and that becomes a lot easier to see how this is actually dynamically scoped. So dynamic scoping really is where the this end arguments, and, and we agreed earlier we shouldn't use arguments anymore, but we still have to use this, unfortunately, isn't it? So this and arguments are dynamically scoped. Everything else is lexically scoped. And so this is the behavior of a regular function. But the obvious question is, how does this work for an arrow function? Well, let's talk about that real quick. Uh, in, a, in an arrow function, uh, all variables, uh, including this end arguments, so this end arguments, uh, arguments are lexically scoped. 
So this is one of the things you have to be very careful about. So when it comes to regular functions versus arrow functions, the behavior is very different. To illustrate this, let's go back and run this code one more time. So if I go back over here and execute this, notice the last line in both of those, 42 and 77. But the change I'm gonna make here is I'm gonna take this line right here and only this line, I am going to replace this with a function to an arrow function. That's all I did, the change I did. Now when I run the code this time, notice it's 12 and 12 in the end. It's no longer that 42 and 77. And that is because this one is dynamic scoping, dynamic for function, uh, on the other hand, lexical for arrow function. So it, in other words, that this binding is different based on what you are using. So this is something you have to be extremely careful. If you just do a in, in place replacement, you're in for a really big surprise because the semantic meaning is different between those two. Uh, you can extend this as a corollary. It makes zero sense to write a arrow function for a method of a class. Because a method of a class requires dynamic binding of this. So if you use an arrow function for a method of a class, it's a disaster waiting to happen. So you can use an arrow function where it makes sense. So saying that we can use an arrow function for everything is really a dangerous situation to be in. We have to know what we are doing because semantics is different. It's not an in-place replacement. So that's something you have to be very careful about. So we're about the halfway point right now. So let's go ahead and take a 15 minute break just to give an opportunity for you to stretch and, and go around. And then when we come back, we will continue for the next half of this presentation. Thank you. All right, uh, welcome back. Let's uh, talk about uh, what we're gonna do in the remainder of the session. We, are, we talked about a number of things so far. We talked about um, the let versus constant instead of var. We talked about uh, using um, rest and spread default parameters. We talked about writing our own iterators and how painful that can become. We looked at generators. But then we wrapped up uh, the last part by talking about arrow functions. And we talked about the semantical difference between regular functions and arrow functions. Uh, what we're going to do for the remainder of the part is talk a few more things about uh, working with uh, template literals, uh, object literals, and then spend a little bit of time on destructuring, which is a pretty amazing feature. And after that, we'll talk about classes, and we'll talk about using uh, writing classes, uh, using uh, inheritance, but we'll also talk about some of the semantical differences again, and, and things that we have to be a bit careful about when it comes to using the modern syntax. And then we'll wrap up with that uh, after talking about that in the, towards the end. So we got quite a f number of fun things ahead, so let's get moving. So I want to talk about template literals. You saw me use this quite a bit already, but let's take a look at a quick example here just to see how this uh, works. So if I were to provide, let's say, a uh, price is equal to, uh, let's say, 12.25, uh, and we'll say it's a constant price. But I want to be able to print the price, so I could say the price is, and then I could put a little dollar and then we could put a price like this. We have all seen code like this before, but that's not a lot of fun to write. So we want a much elegant syntax. I mentioned in the beginning of the last uh, part that JavaScript doesn't have the ability to deprecate things. JavaScript uh, doesn't have the ability to change the meaning of what is already there because old code is going to still be there, legacy code that's being sent to modern browsers uh, and, uh, and newer engines, and they still have to work the way they once did. So in, in, in order to do this, what they did is they decided to introduce a new syntax for uh, template uh, uh, literals, uh, or, or uh, template uh, literals. So, so how does this really work? Let's put a little single quote for a minute, and right in here, let's go ahead and put a little single quote again, but I'm gonna put a dollar right there, and end with a single quote. Well, single quotes already exist in JavaScript, and as you can see, that's the output it produces. Uh, take the same thing again, but this time use a double quote right there, 
And double quote also already was there. They can change the meaning of it. So that's what it really did. But on the other hand, let's take this one. But instead of a single quote or a double quote, we use a back tick. So when you use a back tick, a back tick is used for a template literal. So this is a newer syntax introduced. So uh, it's sometimes easy to not be able to see it properly. Uh, sometimes people think it's a single quote, but it's not a single quote. It's literally a back tick that you're using to begin and end this. And that becomes a, a template literal that you can use to specify uh, uh, expression that you want to expand and evaluate at that point. So that becomes a lot easier to work with. As you can see, I'm able to use a dollar inside of that. But a dollar with a curly signifies a, a, um, a, a expression, if you will, whereas a dollar without the curly is just a literal dollar. You don't have to worry about doing any uh, escaping. Uh, the next thing I want to show you here is a feature called object literal. But when I show you the way that I'm going to show you, you probably will get a little angry at this feature. Because when I looked at it, I said, gosh, this is nasty. But in a different context, this is really a useful feature. But let's look at the uh, object literal real quick. So I want to create a class, an object called Sam. But I want to say a name of this object. So we can say Sam over here for a minute. Now, in this case, I'm going to just go ahead and print out Sam. And you will notice the name of the ob uh, uh, name is Sam, and that, that's a value that we have. I can also go back here and say comma age. And let's say the age is 2, and you can see the value of age is 2. So far, so good. But what if I have a constant, the name is equal to, and I'm going to specify Sam over here. But I'm also going to specify constant, the age is equal to, let's say, 2. Now, of course, I can use the name right here. And I can also use the age right here as well. Now, we know what these things are. We know these things are lexical scoping. So the name actually comes from the lexical scope. And similarly, the age comes from the lexical scope. And so we are able to use that from that particular context. So that's pretty easy. Now, of course, but we can reduce the syntax, the noise here a little bit. So what if? We can go a little further. What if this is not called the name? What if this is called name like this? And what if this is not called the age? What if it's called age? Then, before we change this, keep this in mind, the structure within this, of course, is a property name colon value, property name colon value. Well, in this case, I'm going to change it to a name, and I'm going to change it to an age. So that worked really nicely. But now that we have a name and age value given that way, we can now reduce a little bit by removing this entirely from there. So you can see I simply put a curly name. And because there's a name in the lexical scope, the property called name takes on the value of the variable from the lexical scope called name. And similarly, I can remove this part as well. And as a result, you can see how we can simply minimize the code we are writing to initialize this object with those values. Now, given this example, I'm not a big fan of what I'm seeing here. And the reason is it's not that convincing why this would be a useful feature. But we'll look at this in an entirely different context in a few minutes. And I hope we'll be able to appreciate that a lot better. So, But of course, object literal has a lot more feature than I showed you here. But I want to switch over to destructuring. Uh, we talked about destructuring just a little bit in the past when I was showing you the enhanced for loop, but I want to go a little deeper into destructuring. There are two things you can do with the destructuring, array destructuring and object destructuring as well. And I'm going to talk about both of those in here. Let's talk about array destructuring first, and then we will go into object destructuring afterwards. So let's start with a little example here. Let's say we have a get person as a first one, and the get person is going to return, let's say, return an array, and the array is going to be, let's say, over here, we'll say John and Quincy, uh, and we'll say Adams right here. So we have three values. I am returning from this particular uh, 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 function as an array. Well, great. Now I'm going to say person is equal to get person. And, and of course, I can print the person entirely here. That worked. But I want to really get the value separately out. How do I do this? Well, I could say constant first is equal to person square bracket 0. 
constant middle is equal to person square bracket one, and constant, if you will, last is equal to a person square bracket two. And then of course, I can print out at this point, let's say first, and let's go ahead and print out the middle, and then finally, let's print out the last over here. Well, when I run this code, you got those three values. While that worked, this is a lot of code to do a little thing. Wouldn't it be nice to reduce the amount of code, the verbosity in here? Well, the answer is yes, we can do that. So we can just delete that for a minute, I'll put a square bracket and say first, middle, and last right in there, and we can get rid of that part entirely. So in other words, while we are receiving an array of data, we can ask it to assign and destructure the contents of the array into these values directly. Now, of course, the question is, what if I don't care about the middle name? I don't want it, I don't really care about the second argument. Well, then get rid of the middle from here, that, you, that way you don't print it, but why bother even receiving it? You can get rid of that as well. I'm not a big fan of this approach because can you imagine looking at a piece of code like that? This is, uh, this is called cruelty, but used very minimally, this wouldn't be too bad, so use your judgment how far you wanna go with that. Well, that's great so far, but I wanna get everything that I have. I don't care about the rest of the stuff, so I'm gonna say all else, and I wanna print all else right in there. But you know this is not gonna work because all else is Quincy, not Quincy and Adams. But of course, we can fix that very nicely by using the three dots over there. So that becomes a greedy fetch. So it gets the first and everything else, rest of it, into it. So that becomes a nice way to destructure that code, that, that data, so that's a very effective way. As much as this is really nice, one of the disadvantages of this is it's working based on an array, which means the position matters. But a lot of times we don't care about the position, we just want property names to work with. The nice thing is we can use destructuring with objects as well, not just arrays. So let's rework this example to use uh, objects rather than uh, array. So what I'm gonna do here is to go back to this code and say return, but I'm gonna return a first as John, and I'll return middle, so as you can see I'm returning objects now, and finally I'm gonna say this is gonna be uh, let's say Adams over here, and I'm gonna return those values. So now I can say constant person is equal to get person, but I can print out right here, uh, a per, uh, we'll start with just a person dot first. Well, you know that would work, but that's a little verbose code. Why don't we do the following? We can say constant first is equal to person dot first. We can say constant middle is equal to person dot middle and then constant last is equal to person uh, dot last. Well, actually, let me do a little different. Let's say first name, and I'll, I'll come back to where I'm going with this in a little bit later. So we have this first name, last name, and middle name. Now what I can do here, though, is we can simply say first name, and then we can provide the middle name, and then finally we can provide the last name right here to print. So that works as well as we can see in here. But of course, looking at this code, it's a little verbose and noisy. Why can't we just use destructuring to reduce the noise? And the answer is yes, we can. So going back over here, we can say first is first name. Before we go further, let's stop and look at it. Now the syntax is a little hard to remember, but this is the property name and this is the local variable you're defining. So in other words, this is really from the target object. This is the local variable. Now, still that doesn't quite convince me to remember this. So how do I really remember this? Here's a way to remember it. Think of it this way. I'm gonna say prop and I'll say local is equal to. Now go back to how you will define the value, prop colon value. This part is easy for us, right? Because this is how we define a JavaScript object by putting a property name colon value. Well, you keep the same structure on the left side, so this is more like a pattern matching. You are simply saying prop is prop, local variable is value. 
So think of it as a pattern matching, then it becomes a lot easier to remember that syntax. So you're using the same syntax as defining an object, rather than giving a value, you are providing the variable to bind that value to. So as a result, first name, first name, and middle, and I'm gonna say middle name, and then I can say last over here is going to be last name. And, and then I can remove those three lines from there. So that becomes a lot easier to write, as you can see. Going a little further though, what I can do is I could say this is first and this is first as well. And that way I can say this is middle and this becomes a middle as well, oops, middle as well. And then finally I could say this is last and this is last also. If I decide to keep the same names on both sides, which means we can then remove that part and we can remove that part and finally we can remove that part as well and as a result we can do a little bit of destructuring to minimize the verbosity in there. So when you look at this code, your eyes have to kind of scan through to figure out what you're using. The little curly there says that you are actually defining an object, but in this case, because an object on the right side, you're destructuring into an object, and the variable name first maps to a local variable and the property at the same time. So that becomes a nice way to destructure this. Okay, so this is useful to receive a data, but what about sending this to a particular object? To understand this, let's take a look at a slightly different example. Let's say Sam name is gonna be Sam. Let's say age is gonna be two. And let's say street is going to be, oh, let's go ahead and say address. We'll say address rather. So address is going to be, uh, let's say street. And this is gonna be 101 let's say main street, and don't worry about other arguments for that, but let's also say mailing, and this is going to be a mailing address, and this is gonna be street colon, we'll say 105 uh, Smith Street. So we have this data, and I wanna use this information, how do I you know, work with it? So let's go ahead and say a function over here, and this is gonna be printed, and that takes a object person, and within this function, I'm gonna say, uh, we'll go ahead and say a person, well, name, first of all, so we'll say name, well, person.name, right? So person.name, and I'm gonna say uh, is, how old is this person? We'll go ahead and say person.age, years old. We'll start with this little example. So we are printing person name, Sam is two years old. So I could call print it. I can pass Sam to it now. And of course, in that case, let's actually move this up here. So in this case, it says Sam is two years old. Well, but how about reducing noise a little bit? Let's try this again. Constant name is equal to person dot name and constant age is equal to person dot age. So then we can simply say name over here and we can say age over here. That worked as well, but going a little further, how about reducing the noise a little bit more? So let's put a curly here and say name comma age, and I can assign a destructure right in place. So as a result, oops, almost there. So this is gonna be person. So you can see Sam is two years old. Okay, so far so good, but grab this part right in there remove this and replace person with that. So when you run that code, now you have destructuring in the parameter list itself. So as a result, when you're passing this person, you're saying, think of this like filtering. You're saying this person has these properties, but I don't care about most of them. I only care about these two properties. I don't care about the remaining properties and you can filter it out. So this becomes a really nice way to extract only the content you care about. Now in this case, of course, the name is a local variable that maps to the property called name at this point. Hey, how about getting the address from the street? Well, here's the deal. You can say comma and street colon address. You can give a different name over here if you wanted to, but I'm gonna just get the address right now from the street. So I'm gonna say street colon 
And then address that's coming from within here, I'm going to specify the address as a value that I want to receive from within that. So this gives an opportunity for us to go to this, uh, sorry, this is address, isn't it? Pardon me. This is address, and then from that I'm going to get the street. So when I run this code, we want to know what address Sam is, so I can print the street right there, which is 101 Main Street. I'm like, okay, that's awesome, but what if I really want to get the mailing address as well? So unfortunately, we cannot do this, right? So if you say comma, and I say address colon, and uh, sorry, this is mailing, right, colon, and then I'm going to say street. We're in trouble because this is a street and this is a street, but this is an address, but this is mailing. So this address, oh, first of all, before we go any further, sorry, one more thing to emphasize here. Going back to this code, notice we got the street. Address is not defined. Only the street is defined. So if I were to uh, try to print address, that gives an error because this is only defining name, age, and street. But I want to get the mailing address. What do I do for that? So comma, and we will say mailing, and this becomes a street, and that won't work. What is the problem on line number three? Duplicate parameter name is not allowed. You already defined a street, you cannot define one more street. So what gives? You say question, colon, we can say mailing uh, uh, M street, whatever you want to call it, or mailing street. And then of course you can come down here and you can print out M street at this point and get the value one of, one of I, Smith street. So this gives you an idea about how we can extract the content we are interested in without having to really deal with uh, getting the entire object and stripping values out of it. So your object may have a number of different properties, but you can specify what you really care about and extract only those in your code, and you can use it as well. And you can extract it at the point of call, and that becomes a very effective way. Uh, there are two reasons why you want to be comfortable with these. Uh, you may want to use these, but you're also going to look at code that other people are using this quite often, especially when you start using different libraries in JavaScript, you're going to uh, run into this very often. And, and if we're not comfortable with this, it can become really agonizing trying to understand that piece of code. So getting comfortable with this can help us quite a bit to deal with it. So that's basically about destructuring. Now let's switch gears, talk about object-oriented programming in JavaScript. So we all have used O in a lot of different languages. It turns out JavaScript has been supporting object-oriented concepts for a very long time, except it's been a mess to deal with in the past. Um, I'm really happy they cleaned up a lot of stuff. So moving forward, it's a lot better pleasant experience, but we still have to be very careful using these, and that's what we're gonna spend the time on looking at some of these ideas and concepts. First of all, what about creating objects? Well, let's take a look at one example here. Suppose I want to write a function. So I say function foo, and I'm going to simply say foo called so we can display that little message, and I'm going to call the function called foo. But you're like, hey, create an object for me, please. Okay, sure, I'll create an object. So what am I going to do? Well, we could have written it like the way I did before. We could have said function right here as well. It doesn't change anything much in this context for what we are discussing. So when we run this, it said food called. But constant car equal to function. And in this case, I'm gonna simply say output. We'll just say call for a minute. Now let's get rid of the, well, let's not call foo, but let's call new car. Now look at this for a second. What are we doing? I want to define a class called car. Well, I did. And you protest, you say, wait a minute, Venkat, that's not a class, it's a function. No, trust me, it's a class. How do I say? Did you notice the uppercase C? So this is the sad part, isn't it? It was a purely a convention in JavaScript. And you had to know it's a lowercase versus uppercase. Now, clearly, there are a few problems with this. If I do a new, you call the function. But if I call car like that, you call the function too. Now, what gives? How do you know which one to use and which one not to use? This is very confusing. Actually, this is even worse. 
I will go ahead and say step one here, and I'll go ahead and say step two here so we can see the difference. And, and when I run this, it's a step one and step two, but I go back into this class and I print out over here, new.target. And when I run this code, notice, in the, in the step one, it says right there, step one, and it says function car. In the second one, it says undefined. What in the world is happening here? Well, it turns out what's happening here is that it is having a special feature called new.target, where the new.target is really available when you invoke it as a constructor, but when you invoke it as a regular function, the new.target doesn't exist. So if you really wanted to, you could come in here and check for new.target. If the new.target doesn't exist, you can raise a message. For example, how about this? It's undefined, isn't it? So you could say something along the lines of if not, uh, not new.target. So you can say if new.target, uh, if it is not, what can I say? I'm going to say, hmm. So when I run this code, in the second one it said hum. Now what you can do is you can now go to the next sentence and say throw a new error. And you can say you called constructor uh, as, uh, as a regular function, right? Um, how dare um, we will come burn your village. So you can you know, put messages like that, right? So you can pretty much deal with that and blow up, and it says you called constructor as a regular function, how dare will come and burn your village. But as you can see, that's only getting really more nasty, right? We don't want to be doing that. So what can you do? This is one of the problems is you had to put all that code to deal with it, which is kind of messy. Not only did we not create a class, we created a function, and then we put more patches around it. And that's not really elegant. Wouldn't it be nice to just settle down and write a class for once? Good news, we can write classes now. All that is taken care of for us nicely. How so? Let's look at an example here. So class car, and I create a class called car. As simple as that. Now I'm going to say output new car and create an object. Hey, there you go. We created an object of the car. But what if I look for output type of car? <laughs> That's still a function, right? So JavaScript is still holding on to the same semantics as before. So don't, you know, these are questions you don't want to ask. Like, what is your type, right? Don't go there. Life is very peaceful if you don't probe around things you don't want to worry about. But of course, if you go back to this code and say car, because it's after all a function, it blows up saying class constructor cannot be invoked without new. They just don't have the burn your village message, but other than that, they take care of it for you, right? So as you can see in this case, this really protects you from calling that as a function. That's been done pretty elegantly. So this gives you an idea about how to really use a, create a class, and you can simply say class car, and you can create it. Now that we created this, how about writing a constructor for this? Well, that's the nice part. You can write a constructor very elegantly. So you can say constructor, and let's say year, and I'm going to simply say over here, this dot year equal to year. So as a result, I can go ahead and say a constant car equal to new car 2018, and then I can simply output the car object, and you can see the car year is 2018. So the word constructor is referring to a constructor that you're writing. I like this rather than saying uh, the name of the constructor is the name of the class, why not just call this a constructor? Now, to be fair, languages like Java don't use the word constructor, though, though they could. Uh, but in the case of JavaScript, you don't have function overloading. You only have one constructor, so you just call it constructor. Um, so, but that's elegant, that's easy to write, and that created an object for us. But of course, what about creating uh, fields within classes? Well, we just did. We created a field called year right there. You don't define fields in the top like you do in Java or C Sharp. You simply assign the values when you want to assign them as simple as that. What about defining methods? Well, defining methods is really easy also. So for example, I want to define a method called drive. So this dot miles equal to zero. 
and I'm going to define a method called drive. It takes a distance, and what am I going to do? I'm going to simply say this dot miles, okay, sorry, I forgot where I am, kilometers. Okay, so this dot kilometers is equal to, the kilometers equal to, let's increase the distance, a plus equal to the distance. So um, as a result, you can run the code. The kilometers is zero, but I can say car dot drive 10, and I can, of course, print the car this time, and you can see the value has changed to 10. So this gives you an idea about how you can write a method. A method is very easy to implement, as you can see. Simply write the method name, a parenthesis, a parameter list, and the body of the code uh, that sits in there really nicely. So that's pretty elegant. Well, what about properties? Now, we know that Java doesn't quite have properties in the sense of properties, but C-sharp has properties. Um, JavaScript kind of comes right in the middle. In the case of JavaScript, you can write properties, but the way you write properties is by writing methods, which are kind of annotated, if you will. So let's look at an example of how this is going to look like in here. So I want to write a property. What kind of property do I want to write? So I want to write a property for color of the car. So I'm going to say color. Now, I'm writing it like it's a method, and I'm going to return, let's say, an orange color, uh, that's the color for my little car. So color is a method that returns orange, but clearly that's a method, we know that. How do I use this stuff? So let's go over here, get rid of a few things so we can see less code. So in this case, I'm gonna simply say output car.color, and as you would expect, the color shows up as orange. But I want a property, not a method. So what do I do? Ideally, I want to be able to call it like this. Not a field, but a property. Now clearly, this is not going to work the way I want it to work. It's going to define a function color. But I can go to this code and say get right in front of it. That's the annotation I was talking about. And notice how it displays orange. So you write the method which takes no arguments. You cannot put any arguments here, right? So if I say A, it fails. It tells you getters must not have any formal parameters. Don't put any parameter here, that's what it says. So you're not allowed to put any parameters and you write a getter by putting the word get. When you call it, you simply call it as, a, as if you call a field, but it's a property. Make no mistake, don't put a parenthesis, that fails too. The, it's not happy you calling it as a function because it's a property, not a function. So this gives you a nice way to define a property, and in this case, it's a getter. Well, what's gonna happen if I said car.color equal to a red? Now, when I run this code, it did not give us any error, but what, is it, what does it really do at this point? Uh, if I were to just simply say color is red, and I wanna print the car after that, uh, what is it going to display? Notice the color is not really there. So what's happening at this point? Well, remember, we saw this in the previous part. JavaScript doesn't give you errors. It kind of quietly ignores what you said. So at this point, if I said use strict again, and, and when I run the code this time, notice color.color equal to red, uh, car.color equal to red gives you an error. Cannot set property of car, which has only a getter. So in other words, if you only have a getter, you cannot set a property, and if you do, it ignores it, or if you have a use strict, it blows up. And, and like I mentioned earlier, you wanna use use strict uh, you know, uh, uh, as much as you can. So that's basically what you saw here is the getter. But of course, you can write a setter as well. So you can say set color value, and in this case, what do I wanna do? I could say, this dot, uh, you know, a stored color, if I want to call it as that, and value. And of course, I can say over here, this dot stored color is equal to orange to begin with. And then of course, I can return this dot stored color when I return that. So you can see the color was orange in the beginning, but the stored color was red. But this gives you an ability to do some testing as well, or, or validation. You could say if the value is equal to, and you can check for a color you don't want the car to be, and then you can say, hey, I don't want the car to be that color, and if it is, you can blow up and you know, throw an exception. So things like that. 
But of course, you can still get to the field directly, but hopefully, you, when you have properties, your, your users will use the properties, and that becomes a nice way to access that. So that becomes the getters and setters that you can write for these. What about static stuff? Good news and bad news. Going back to this, if I create a class called car, and in the case of a car, I want to create, let's say, a static uh, method. That's pretty easy. You just define the word static, and then you can write a method here, wh whatever you want to write it. I'll call it as tune, uh, info. Let's just call it as info for lack of better things. And I'm going to simply say info called. So how do I use this stuff? I can say car.info and, and call it as a static method. What if I try to call this as an object? So constant car equal to new car, and I say car.info, well, the info is a static, not an instance method. Line number nine doesn't work. You cannot call static stuff on objects. You can only call it on classes. So that becomes a nice way to write a static method. Here's the nice news. You can also have a get, and you can specify a static uh, get. We'll call it as you know something, color, for example, uh, I'm going to write this as, you know, simply return. Uh, let's go ahead and say orange again. And, of course, if, if I call this, I can simply output car.color. I can call this property on the class itself, if that even makes sense. So you can define a property as a static also. Unfortunately, though, what if I want a field? Uh, remember, you don't define field within classes. When did, where did you define the field? Well, within a constructor, of course. But wait a minute, a static doesn't deal with a constructor because it depends to the class, not to an object. Hmm, where do we do? Where do we put that? Well, you put that outside, unfortunately. So if I say count is equal to zero, I can now come here and ask for count, which is a field. But of course, in the constructor, I can say constructor, and I can increase over here a car.count plus plus, so I can say new car, and I can come back and def, uh, output car.count and see that the value has gone to a one. So you define fields outside of the class. Not very elegant, right? But, but that's what you have. Unfortunately, the fields kind of spill out uh, if they are static. So that's basically an example of how you can define things that are static. So we saw static methods, we saw static fields, and we saw the static properties as well. So all that is pretty elegant. JavaScript has one more thing, which is a little bit weird, which is called a class expression. Now, what in the world is a class expression? If I were to say class, and I'm going to say car, and this one here, if you're used to languages like Ruby, in languages like Ruby, everything is an expression. Your classes are expressions too, and you can use them as expression, which is kind of nice. Well, in, in class, languages like Java and C Sharp, classes are not expressions, they are statements. JavaScript gives you both. In JavaScript, classes can be statements or classes can be expressions. So what am I creating right here? Well, if you look at this here, if I output car, the car is a class we created, but what about this one here that you created? That is a statement. But what if I said constant, uh, you know, stuff is equal to, and I want to print it out as stuff like that. Well, notice how I'm assigning the class over to a variable called stuff. Well, that tells you that class is like an expression. It can be used as a statement as well. But when would you want to do one versus the other? Well, this kind of takes us to a little bit of a meta level. What if I want to create a class but I don't want to create a class manually in my code. Maybe I will look at a configuration. Maybe I'll look at a database schema. Maybe I'll look at a property file. Or maybe I will receive a JSON configuration from the request, and I want to create an object on the fly based on what I received at that time. So to understand this, let's look at an example here. We'll call it as a constant. We'll call it as the class factory, right? And the factory is going to take a function, and we will define this as properties. So we'll take baby steps to see how we're going to do this. So I'm going to create a properties as a factory, create class factory. But I'm going to say constant book is equal to 
class factory. Now, I want you to pay close attention to this here. Look at the syntax of book. I put an uppercase B. That tells you that the book is a class and not an object, right? So in other words, a class factory is gonna create a class for me and I can create an object of it. So constant over here, book is equal to new book. And I'm gonna create an object of that book I'm gonna create on the fly. And then once I create it, I wanna print that book out. So how do we dynamically create a class called book? But now that we did, we could even create two books if I wanted to, right? So book one, but I could also create a book two right in here. So this becomes my book two, and I want to print book two. So, of course, we got, we're a long way from running this code, but we'll take baby steps to make this code work. So what is the very first step I'm going to do here? Let's comment this out. We'll come back and make that code work in a few minutes. So let's get started with the class factory first. So I'm going to come in here and say return class, and I'm not giving a name for it. You're not required to give a name for a class. So this is just on the fly. I'm going to create this, and I'm going to simply say OK to see if it's OK with that so far. And you can see how we are returning a class at that point, which means I can assign it to the book over here, and I can come in and display the book. And it turns out that's a class we created on the fly right in there. But what are the things I want to send to this one? Properties. I want to say my book has a title and my book has a number of pages. So I'll say my book has titles and pages. Okay, great. But I want to create a book with titles and pages. How do I do that? Well, here's an idea. I can go back and say this is a rest. So I can simply receive arbitrary number of parameters. So I can create a class and, and I can give a property called title and a property called pages. Well, if that is what I'm going to do, what does this do? A constructor which takes values after all. So I can pass values into my constructor. How do I initialize the values then? Well, here's an idea for a constant property of properties. And I'm going to simply output, well, I'm going to just save this here. So this square bracket, and this is going to be the property that I'm interested in saving. And oh, darn it, I need the values index, isn't it? But we know exactly how to do that. So we can say square bracket index comma property and dot entries, if you remember from the previous part. So we got the entries on our hand. So we can say, here's the property and the value is property, uh, sorry, values, square bracket, index, and this gives me the same sequence of values I get from the properties, and I can stick them into this object. Well, let's see if that took us anywhere at all. We got a book on our hand. Now let's create an object of this book right here. So book one, we want to specify what the title is. Let's go ahead and say this is who moved, uh, moved my cheese. So that's my uh, mood, my cheese. So um, a, a title of a book, and let's say 90 pages long, and we can create an object of this book. And you can see at this point, we were able to create an object of book. The title is who mood, my cheese, pages 90. Let's try this one more time. We'll create yet another book. We'll simply say this is title two, and let's say 101 pages. And right there is title two and 101 pages. But where does this take us? Well, we can do the following now. We could say new, how about this? So we could say new class factory, and we could say title comma volume, whatever that is, and we can create a title and volume. And to that, we can provide uh, an object, right? So this could be maybe a music volume. Let me write it this way. So we could say music equal to uh, create, uh, well, class factory, that, that is. And we could say title and volume of this music. And of course, we can come down here and say new of music. And this is going to be whatever title one, and we'll say volume one. And we can create objects of that type. So this becomes an easy way to create classes dynamically. 
And you can pretty much synthesize classes on the fly rather than sitting and writing these classes over and over based on some configuration data or a database schema or whatever you may receive. And that's all because you have an expression that you have on your hand. If you want to, you can give a name for this as well. And the time that you want to give a name here is if you really want to access static properties, it becomes easier to give a name. Otherwise, you don't have to give a name for it. So that gives you an idea about how you can create and use classes as expressions rather than just as classes. And like I said, you can give an internal name if you want to. The last thing I want to talk about here is inheritance. But before we talk about inheritance, I want to take a slight detour because this is a little dangerous. The concept of classes is awesome. Well, they also gave us inheritance, but it's very important to know that the semantical difference of inheritance in JavaScript, it looks, in the modern syntax, looks like Java, but it's far away from Java. So we need to understand what that means. So for that reason, let's go to the past before we look at the current state of what JavaScript provides. In, in the class, uh, cases like Java and C Sharp and Ruby and Python, several other languages, what do we use? We use what is called class-based inheritance. So what is class-based inheritance? A class inherits from another class, right? That's what it is. Languages like JavaScript, and very few languages do this. Lua is another example. There are few languages that use what are called prototypal inheritance. What is prototypal inheritance? So to understand prototypal inheritance, let's take a look at a slightly different example. So I say Sam is equal to, we'll put name is going to be Sam right here. And in this case, I'm going to go ahead and call a method on Sam. So to understand this, let's go ahead and say use. And this is going to take a person, if you will. So this is going to say person. And within here, I put a try, person.work. And I'm going to print a message, catch exception. And I will simply output not found. So let's go ahead and call use and pass Sam to it. And you got the not found. So far, so good. But what I'm going to do then is to create a little constant. We'll call it as employment is equal to work. And this becomes a function. And all I'm going to do here is simply say working. Just take this example for a second. So I have a method called work in employment. So far, so good. Now, I'm going to call use and pass Sam again. But this time around, what I'll do here is go to Sam. I say object dot set prototype off. Sam comma, let's go ahead and say employment. So I'm taking this object Sam, and I'm assigning a prototype. So what does this really do? Here's a way to think about it. You could come to me and say, hey, Venkat, can I have change for 10 euros, please? You know what? I think I can help you with that. I will reach into my pocket, give you change for 10 euros, not a problem. But what if you say, can I have change for $10, please? There's no real reason for me to call, carry dollars on me right now, but I'm not going to say no. I'm going to reach into my backpack, and I'm going to get you change for dollars from my bag. So my backpack is an extension of me in that sense. So this is exactly what's going to happen in the case of JavaScript. So when I run the code notice, the first time I call use Sam on line 11, it said not found. But on line number 17, the same Sam object quietly provided the working. And the reason it did is because we assigned a prototype to Sam. And what an object does is, if a member doesn't exist, it reaches into a prototype. Now, this is called prototypal inheritance. What is really cool about it is twofold. The first is, example here, let's go to this example for a second. Now we will create one more, not employment, but management. And what does this do? This is playing golf, isn't it? Well, that's how work is done. So now, God forbid, you say object.set prototype of Sam to be management. And now you use Sam, 
and Sam is happy playing golf, uh, you know, when you, when you call work on it. So this gives you the power of taking an object, not changing the object, but changing its prototype and changing its behavior at that point. So in other words, inheritance, so here's a way to think about it, right? So class-based inheritance, inheritance is static. I'm using the word static as that is inflexible, right? On the other hand, a proto, prototypal inheritance is flexible, right? Is dynamic. So what does that mean? Uh, that is, uh, it is flexible, right? Uh, that is flexible. So this is one big difference between how these languages do. In the case of Java and C Sharp and various other languages, once a class inherits from a base class, you're stuck with it. This is your base class forever, right? Unless you change your code or use other advanced techniques like AOP. Let's not worry about that right now. So once your code is written, it's stuck to the parent. Well, in here, it's extremely dynamic. During runtime, you can change what the prototype is. That's one interesting feature. Secondly, you can take an object, it has a prototype, which in turn 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 doesn't have a prototype. So eventually you will run out of it. And so as a result, when you go to an object and ask for something, if it doesn't have it, goes to the prototype, doesn't have it, goes to the prototype, it keeps walking down the chain until it hits the end or finds what it wants. And if it finds what it wants, you're done. If not, it says, sorry, I don't have it. So this gives you a really nice flexibility to build a hierarchy of prototypes. Let's enter in this thought for just a little bit. So moving a little forward, let's say we have a, let's go to the old style for a minute. So constant car equal to function. And in this case, I'm gonna say car dot miles equal to zero. Okay, kilometers equal to zero, right? So in this example, I have a value of zero that's I've defined for this. Notice where this is located. It's on the car, but I'm gonna put it on a car dot prototype dot, and every object has a prototype. But let's examine this a little bit to understand how this actually works. So I'm gonna say constant a car one equal to new car, and I'm gonna say constant car two. So a car two is equal to new car as well. I wanna ask the question, is car one the same as car two? Well, clearly no, they're two different objects. Um, okay, great, is the, tell me if object get prototype of car one is the same as object dot get prototype of car two. Well, guess what? The answer to that second question is true because multiple objects share their prototype, right? So I have two objects, but both the objects have the same prototype, right? So if you come from here to the prototype, you come from here to the prototype, they both are sharing the same exact prototype, right? That's what you're seeing here. Great, now my next issue here, I'm gonna go to this code, we know the answer for these two, but let's go over here and say drive. What does the drive do? It takes a distance and says this dot miles plus equal to distance or kilometers in this case. So great so far, let's output car one, but what is the car one's miles gonna be in the beginning is the question, right? So what's gonna be the value? We'll, we'll come back to that in just a second. So I wanna ask the question, where's the kilometers? Well, that's located in the prototype. So I'm gonna ask for the kilometers on car one. I'm gonna ask kilometers on car two. Let's see what the result is uh, in, in, in what it returns for us. Well, this is a old syntax, isn't it? So let me fix this a little bit. So this is gonna become, pardon me, constructor. Well, okay, so this is gonna become the old style this dot uh, drive is equal to function, and in this case, we'll take a distance, and we will say this dot uh, kilometers is, is plus equal to uh, distance. Let's try this a little bit. 
So zero and zero, hey, that's great. We know the kilometer values are zero, no doubt about it. Now let's get back here and say car one dot drive 10. And I'm gonna ask for car one dot kilometers and you exactly know what the value is gonna be. It is a 10. But I'm gonna ask the question car two dot kilometers. Hmm, interesting. Notice the value was in the prototype, right? And when we asked for the prototype's value, it was zero. And when you ask for the value here, it was zero. Then we call the drive. That is 10. What in the world would that be? The logical mind says it should be zero. The emotional mind says, damn it, this is JavaScript, who knows, <laughs> right? So we're not sure, isn't it? Oops, pardon me, we're not sure. And that's a moment of tension, isn't it? And you're like, gosh. And even worse, if it does work, you're like, why does it work? That's the next question. <laughs> so to understand this, let's take a slightly different example and work through it. So let's, let's, let's think about this a little differently. And I need a, a, a bunch of volunteers for this. Would you be able to volunteer for me? You can sit there comfortably. What's your name, sir? Marcel. Marcel. So would you be my prototype? Yes. So he admitted in public, he's going to be my prototype. So he's my prototype. Which means, if I don't have a property, I know exactly whom to reach into, right? And ask for. Well, let's say, what's your name, sir? Young uh, Sorry, say it again? Young Young case is, let's say he comes over to me and says, could I borrow a euro from you, please? You know what? It's not a big deal. It looks like a respectable person. I'm going to trust him here, and I give him a euro. And a few minutes goes by. He comes back and says, that was a great help. I just had to get something from the vending machine, but now I have the cash with me. Thank you, Venkat, and he gives it back to me. So we have built a trust between each other now. So he, gives, he takes the euro from me. He gives me back the euro. Everything is fine. The next day, he comes back to me and says, Venkat, I'm in rush right now. Uh, I, I know you, I've given you the money back. Can I get 100 euros from you? You know what? We built a relationship already. We have trust with each other. So I want to give you 100 euros. Except for one problem. I don't have 100 euros. What should I do? Ask the prototype, right? There's a reason why he volunteered. So 100 <laughs> euros, please. So what does he do? He gives me 100 euros, right? I have 100 euros with me now because I got it from the prototype, and I give it to him. Well, a few hours goes by. He comes back and says, Venkat, you've been a great help again. Thank you so much, and gives me back the 100 euros. Does anyone have a suggestion what I should do with this 100 euros? <laughs> I like your idea. Keep it. <laughs> Does anyone have a problem with it? I'm not obviously looking at him, right? <laughs> so yeah, only one person has a problem with it, right? But democracy rules. Anybody thinks I should keep it, right? Of course. So yeah, if you understand how this worked, you know exactly how JavaScript works. So one of the things to keep in mind is this. And when it comes to prototype, the JavaScript prototype, the way is, gets our deep, sets our shallow. So let's go over this again. He came to me and said, can I have 100 euros, please? I don't have it. My get is deep. I go to my prototype and say, could I have 100 euros, please? You know what? If he doesn't have it, he's got a rich person behind him. And he can go through, and eventually, I get 100 euros, gets our deep. On the other hand, when he gives me back the euros, I keep it because such are shallow, I don't go down. So to understand this, when I run the code this time, this is the reason why the value is a zero, as you can see. But let's go a step further to prove this. Notice now, I'm gonna comment out all of this code for a second, and I'm gonna go back here and just print the car. When I print the car, notice what you saw here. The car has a drive, no sign of kilometers right now. Then I go to the second one, and I print it also. No, no sign of kilometers again at this point. Then I call the drive on that one. Then I go back to print car one. All of a sudden, notice car one. 
now has are kilometers. Now, that kind of nails it, isn't it? When you asked for kilometers on line 12, the car didn't have it. So it went to the prototype and got it. But on line number 15, when you said car1.drive, you went to line number three. Line number three said this dot km equal to, that's a set, but a set is shallow on this where this is a car object. And as a result, it set it on the object. And if you go back and examine car two right now, because we did not do any set on car two, notice there's no km on car two. So this illustrates, and thanks for your help, this illustrates how the gets are deeper, but sets are shallow. And this is the magic of prototypal inheritance in JavaScript. And it's important to keep this in mind. The reason I emphasize this is, the syntax here is horrible, but the behavior is fantastic. I love prototypal inheritance, right? Because it gives you some enormous power on your hand. So, so the way they have done it behind the scenes is really good. The syntax is horrible. In the modern JavaScript, the semantics is exactly what I showed you here. No change whatsoever. The syntax is elegant. But there's a problem. The syntax is so elegant that we tend to forget what it really is under the hood. So we have to keep in mind, while the syntax is different, the semantics is still the same as it was in JavaScript. That is something we have to be very careful about. So now let's get to the modern syntax. So how do we inherit from a class? So to understand how this works, let's get back to a class called person. And I say constructor, we'll say first comma last. And I'm going to simply say over here, this dot first is equal to first. And this dot last is equal to last. Now let's go ahead and say constant. Let's say, for example, here is uh, Sam equal to new person. We'll say Sam, and we'll say Walker here. And let's, uh, then let's go ahead and output the value. That's the value. But let's create a class now called uh, you know, a, a cool person. And this extends from person. Now, look at this code for a second. If this was JavaScript, sorry, if this was Java or C Sharp, you will be now writing a constructor. JavaScript says, sit back and relax. If you don't want a constructor, don't write one. They will do the wiring for you. So if you don't write a constructor, one is written for you already. You don't have to put any more effort into this. Now what am I going to do? I'm going to go back over here, and I'm going to say over to string, and what does the to string method do? Return. I'm going to return this dot, so this dot first, and space, let's say, this dot last. So I'm going to return that value to the cool person, uh, to the person. If I go back over here to this code now, and if I say constant, and I'm going to say Alan equal to new cool person, we'll say Alan right here, and I'm going to create over here an output Alan. So when I output Alan, you can see I can call the two string method right in there without any difficulty, and it says Alan Turing. But I want to provide a coolness index over here. So constructor, now I'm writing a constructor because I want to extend this further. So constructor, and I'm going to say first, last, and index. And I'm going to then say over here, super, and pass the first and last. Then I say this dot index is equal to index. Uh, this could be a coolness index I want to set. So as a result, I can go pass a value here into this. Now just to illustrate this, if I move this here, it is angry. I cannot touch this until I pass the data to super. But of course, what I can do here though, is I can simply say called, and that's perfectly fine. I just cannot touch the this in this particular case. So you can pass the data to the base very nicely. Well, that's awesome. We are able to pass the data to the base nicely. But having said that, if I go back over here, I can override the to string. Now, the syntax was horrible in the past. But look at the beauty of this. Return super.toString. 
and then a dollar this dot index and I can just pass that value very nicely at this point to the base and then use that information here without having to do extra work. So that becomes a very nice way to do the super call to the base class as well. While you do all of this, it's absolutely critical to keep in mind, while this looks like class-based inheritance, the syntax is so close to what we do in Java, isn't it? But, but the reality is far from the truth uh, in terms of how Java works. This is not class-based inheritance. This is object-based inheritance. That is something we have to be very, very, very careful about. Just to illustrate the point, if I go back here to Alan, and I'm going to output a object dot get prototype prototype off, and I'm going to say Alan. Notice that's the cool person. All right. Now let's just go one more level. Object dot get prototype off, and ask one more level, and that's the person. So you can alter the prototype and do things the same way you did before, but you have to be very careful altering it though. But these are some of the new methods given to you. So methods like get prototype off and set prototype off make your life a lot easier. And as a result, it gives you the ability to reach into the object and, and be able to uh, talk to this object in terms of prototype. So the inheritance model is very different in JavaScript compared to what's in Java. One of the fears I have about this is they made the syntax so much like Java, we tend to forget this and say, oh, this is inheritance. Well, we gotta keep in mind, this is not a class-based inheritance, this is still object-based inheritance, which is prototypal inheritance. And, and as a result, the behavior is very different. While class-based inheritance is not flexible, the prototypal inheritance is extremely flexible, and so you're dealing with a completely different semantics in the language compared to what you're used to in languages like Java and, and, and JavaScript. This is also important to keep in mind when you program in language like TypeScript, right? The same thing applies to it because TypeScript compiles to JavaScript. So the semantics is JavaScript semantics, even though the syntax is Java-like syntax. And then we have to be very careful about it, otherwise we could be in trouble with it. So this shows you how you're able to define it. You can also have properties overriding as well. So you could override a property and call the super on the base as well if you really wanted to do that. So if you want to do more error checking on your properties in the derived class, you can do that as well and then forward it to the base class. It works really nicely. And like I said, one of the nice things about this is if you don't write a constructor, it writes a constructor for you. So when I write code in you know, uh, libraries like React, I write a React component, which is, which is something like this. I would say class my component and then extends from here and I say component but the only method I usually write is the render method where I return something from this uh, and the beauty of this is I can go ahead and say import for example react comma component over here and and then of course uh, from react but I don't bother to write a constructor and the reason I don't bother to write a constructor is I'm not doing anything special in the constructor. But if I do want to do something in the constructor, then and only then do I write a constructor, and then I say props, but then I immediately say super and send the properties to the base class, and then I do the code, whatever I want to. But the beauty is, if you don't have this line, don't even bother writing the rest of the constructor. That's a waste of effort because inheritance automatically forwards things to the constructor for you without you having to write anything. So that becomes really uh, easy to work with in terms of uh, inheritance. You don't have to put too much effort into writing that. So that gives you an idea about how you are able to use inheritance, in this case, to forward the data to the base class. So that becomes a pretty uh, nice way. So, so that is about writing a constructor, and we talked about the default constructors, we talked about overriding methods also. There are quite a few other things you can do with uh, JavaScript, and one of them is modules. Modules is not entirely implemented properly, but you have to be a bit careful how you implement modules. But one of my favorite uh, in JavaScript, modern JavaScript, is also metaprogramming. 
and they have introduced a concept of proxies, which is pretty amazing. And proxies allow you to inject behavior into classes at runtime so that you can synthesize methods while the code is executing, and that is something you can do as well, which obviously takes us into some advanced features of the language. But if you're used to languages like Groovy in the past, one of the things I enjoyed in languages like Ruby and Groovy is that you're able to inject methods at runtime based on a certain uh, runtime behavior. Well, you can do that now in modern JavaScript thanks to the introduction of proxy, and as a result, you can inject behavior into the class at runtime, much like you do in languages like Groovy and Ruby, and that takes you uh, through the next level as well. So to summarize what we talked about here, we talked about the capabilities of the language, some really nice capabilities in terms of using the code for day-to-day -day programming. We also saw how the uh, syntax is so much cleaned up in terms of creating classes, and then we saw how inheritance works as well, and again, there the syntax is cleaned up a lot. Uh, if you are interested further, uh, please do take a look at the book, Rediscovering JavaScript, uh, if that is something. And I cover, uh, 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 I probably covered about, I'm going to say 70% of what's in the book in this talk. And, and there are a few other uh, uh, concepts in there in the book as well. So that's something you can take a look at if you're interested. If you want to download the examples I showed you here, you're most down, uh, welcome to download them from my website as well. Uh, if you look for examples, you will find them there. That's all I have. Hope that was useful. Thank you.